Great. Welcome, everyone. This is absolutely fantastic to see so many familiar names and some new names as well. Um, what a great modern world we live in now where we can uh, speak with one another, see each other uh, from all corners of the globe. Uh, some of you know me. My name is Dr. Bowen Gilly, uh, also known as Bo Gilly. And it's a, a privilege and a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Mr. T.A.S. Sandy McPherson. As you may have read from the introduction today, Sandy holds the distinction of being one of the last surviving members of uh, the association who was present at the first McPherson gathering in 1947. Now, I joined the McPherson Association back in the late 90s as a junior member. I still have my membership card, in fact. Uh, and I recall members of the New England branch, which I joined at the time, uh, speaking Sandy's name with something approaching great reverence. Uh, and I had the opportunity to meet Sandy several years later when I had the honor to serve uh, as an intern at the museum. Uh, and at that time, Sandy and his, his wife, who joins in today, Catherine, uh, they took me under their wing, uh, really almost adopted me and, and introduced me to the museum and to the many uh, iconic colorful characters uh, yeah. of the Scottish branch. So anyone who spent time with Sandy over the years does know that he's a, a consummate yeah. storyteller and a historian of, of great renown, not only of clan history, but of Scottish history in general. And in his spare time, I believe he still gives walking tours of Edinburgh and serves as a historical interpreter for the National Museum of Scotland. So again, my very great pleasure today to introduce and welcome Sandy McPherson to our first uh, talk in the series. So Sandy, I, I, I pass the, the mic, so to speak, over, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Bo. Well, cousins, I'm addressing you all as cousins, as I assume that you are all connected to the clan McPherson in some degree or another, an adherent, a, a hanger-on if necessary. So we are all cousins, we all have a mutual ancestor somewhere way back. So good evening, cousins. Well, first of all, uh, let me say this is a very unusual thing. I've never done this sort of thing before. So if things go wrong, blame Bo, not me. <laughs> he twisted my arm into doing this. <laughs> it's all his fault. <laughs> right. Now, Bo has mentioned that I was the uh, one of the few survivors of that very first gathering in 1940. Uh, I can only think of one other person, a cousin of mine, uh, Rona Jenkins, who presently lives in Carlisle. I think everybody else must have disappeared to a great gathering in the sky somewhere. Around. But um, quite interesting. Now, the Scotland of 1947, for a start, was extremely different from the Scotland that we know today. It was only two years after the end of the Second World War. It was a period of grim austerity. The country was nearly bankrupt. Everything was rationed, food, clothing, fuel, all these useful commodities. It, it, was, it was a pretty gray place, really, in comparison to what it is today. And I think that to hold a clan gathering in the hope of attracting a lot of people from different parts of the country was a expression of hope. And I think, that, um, I think that it's paid off because it's continued ever since. Now, I, um, oh yes, uh, one other thing. Uh, if you go to the Clan Museum, you'll see um, an application form to go to that gathering. And one of the telling little items says, remember and bring your ration book. Food was rationed. <laughs> an interesting reflection on the times. Now, I was living in Orkney at the time. My father was a doctor there. And I made the long journey from the Orkney Islands right down to Newton Moor all on my own. I, I flew to Inverness and then I changed to a train which I got to Newton Moor, which was not bad for an 11 year old unaccompanied. I think my parents must have a great faith in my, uh, my abilities as a traveler. But I made it and I stayed with my grandparents in their house in Spayville and Station Road, which was absolutely heaving with McPhersons. I don't know how many people stayed in that house at that time, but uh, there was an incredible number of them. They seemed to come and go, and I know I slept, in a, I slept on the floor in my grandfather's study. I remember that. It was rather a hard floor, too. Um, chief memories of that gathering? I remember the Clan March, which started in the middle of Newton Moor somewhere, and processed along the village street, uh, turned off just beyond the village hall, went across the railway bridge, down onto the golf course. 
because that's where the Highland Games were held in those days. Nowadays they're on the island, right at the other end of the village. But in those days it was on the golf course. And I still remember processing along a long, long queue of McPhersons. I was right at the, right at the end of the male part of it, just before the females, because ladies marched in those days, quite different. And um, my recollection is standing there in extremely hot sunshine, listening to a lot of old men making interminably long speeches, some of which were even in a foreign language. It was extraordinary. I was, rather, I was really rather bored. But my most interesting memory is one which some of you may have heard of already. On the Saturday evening, there was a great Cayley to be held in the village hall in Newton Moor. We all went there and we took various props with us. And I was instructed to look after one of the props, which was a great big stuffed wildcat in a very aggressive posture. It lives in the museum today. I, well, last, uh, Mary, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think it's in Cluny's Cage, is it? I think. Yeah, and it's, it's had to have a holiday. It's, I think it's in the Dromochta room at the moment. Oh yes, right. Awaiting a perch somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> he, 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 need, he needs a holiday. He's a very elderly gentleman indeed. Anyway, at the end of the Cayley, I was told to take this beast back to Spiegel, where it belonged. And I was just walking out of the hall carrying it, and I was stopped by a man with a camera. He said, can I take your photograph? And I said, yes, we'll carry on. So he did this, small boy, large cat. And then I said, why are you taking my photograph? He said, oh, I'm from a newspaper. Gosh. I said, which newspaper? We said, the Sunday Post. Now, the Sunday Post, uh, for the benefit of those people who don't have the benefit of living in Scotland, is Scotland's best-selling Sunday newspaper. It gets everywhere, even all over Scotland and even outside of Scotland. If my photograph was in that, I would be famous. I'd be set up for the rest of my life. I mean, gosh, this is incredible. Fame and fortune would follow. Well, the next day, I bought a copy of the Sunday Post. No photograph. The next Sunday, another copy of the Sunday Post. No photograph. I was devastated. At 11 years old, it's a hard blow to bear, I tell you. I think my photograph is somewhere on a cutting room floor in the publishers in Dundee still. That's the sad story of that gathering. Now, um, what about other memories of other, other gatherings? I remember one where we gathered at Old Relief in order to march in pouring rain and a thunderstorm. We took refuge in a small hut with a corrugated iron roof. The, the rain drummed down so hard and could hardly hear ourselves speak. We were worried the standard bearer might have gone out and been struck by lightning. It was a dangerous thing to do. So that was that one. Now, I think the most Momentous rally, though, I do remember, is the 50th one, 1996, an enormous event organised by Ewan, who was the chairman, and Bruce, who was the secretary. They must have worked on it for about a year and a half beforehand. It's an incredible event, over 400 McPhersons attending, literally from the ends of the earth, witnessed the ladies from Borneo who turned up in their colourful costumes, and best of all, a whole busload of Spaniards who appeared. Uh, the men begged, borrowed or stole kilts for the occasion, and at the Cayley they danced a flamenco, and then they invited audience participation. Have you ever seen a man in a kilt dancing a flamenco? You ain't seen nothing yet. That was an incredible event. Uh, well, well worth remembering. Um, the, uh, one big moment in that, of course, was the unveiling of the monument to Cluny of the 45 and that wonderful viewpoint view in Leggan. And there we gathered, 400 strong, gathered round about the monument. It was unveiled by Cluny. Then um, uh, min the McPherson minister said a short prayer. And then from the body of the crowd came the lovely deep baritone voice of George McPherson, a trained operatic singer who struck up the 101st 21st Psalm, I to the hills will lift mine eyes. It was, and it was taken up by the whole crowd. It really was a, a very moving moment, I thought, and well worth coming to hear. Um, another innovation on that one was that we had, um, instead of a Monday walk, we had, um, we had a trip down Loch Erisht to visit Clooney's cage on Ben Alder. Now, 
I, uh, maybe I suggested this, I don't know, at an inappropriate moment, but it was delegated to me to organise this event, which was quite complicated because the Ben Alder estate had just changed hands. It had been bought by a gentleman living in Switzerland, a man of extreme wealth, we understood. He had been the financial advisor to the Sultan of Brunei, who was one of the world's richest men, and I think he was pretty well healed himself. He was living in Switzerland, the estate was being ministered by um, estate agents in Elgin, and all questions that I asked had to go to Elgin and then be conveyed by airmail, before the days of emails, remember, all the way to Switzerland, and then a reply had to come back the same way. So it took a long time to get things going. Anyway, uh, the big breakthrough eventually appeared. I was put in touch with the head stalker on the estate, a very nice man called Ian Strachan, and uh, things went fairly smoothly after that. We had to hire boats from the estate to take people down the loch. There was only one loose end. I wanted to know how long the voyage would take. So I arranged with Ian Strachan that myself and Bruce, who I think was living in Aberdeen at that time, should come across and we would, he would take us down in his boat as far as his cage. But it was very much a working trip. The boat was full of fencing materials, rolls of wire, posts and so forth, which we gave him a hand with at the far end. And um, we went ashore, we saw, took our timing, we came back again. When we got off the boat, then I wanted to take a photograph of the rich man's house. He was building a palace there, an absolute palace. There were men swarming all over it and I knew that um, he didn't like publicity. I'd just taken one photograph and there was a tap on my shoulder and I turned round and there was a huge security man about seven feet tall and just about as broad and he said we don't like photographs here and I got the impression if I had argued my camera would have been in the lock and I probably would have followed so I beat a hasty retreat. Um, however, it all went well. It ended happily, and I think everybody enjoyed the trip. It was a very interesting innovation, and it was an excellent thing. Um, what else? What else? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> another one. Another occasion. The annual general meeting in Newton Moore Village Hall. Um, all the high Hygians were up on the platform, the chairman, the vice chairman, the treasurer, the secretary, and so forth. And I was sitting near the front row. They were getting on quite nicely. It was quite a critical meeting. It was the changeover of chairman. And as I was sitting in the front row, I suddenly thought to myself, there's something missing there. The chairman's chromag, that wonderful staff with all the names of the previous chairman embellished on silver plates on it, it wasn't there. It's got to be handed over at the appropriate moment. Heavens, I thought. So I quickly excused myself dashed back to the back of the hall, let myself out, ran along the village street, which was thronging with people going to the Highland Games. I arrived at the museum. Andrew, the curator, was in the hall giving his report. His man, Nancy, his wife, was there. Nancy, Nancy, the Cromag, I've got to have the Cromag. Oh, I don't know, it's uh, somewhere. It was up on the wall, but it was chained there for, for safe protection. Where's the key? Oh, she scrabbled around in all sorts of places looking for the key. Eventually, she found the key. I grabbed the Cro-Mag and I held it aloft like, like an Olympic torch bearer that made my way back to the hall in the nick of time, just before the handover of that ceremony. Gosh, it's a, it's a strange memory. I don't think the public really appreciates all the things that I'd gone to. <laughs> oh, another one. This is, right, this is an amusing one. Um, again, the Clan March. Meeting at Old Ralea. The band was late in turning up. They always are. They, they like to refresh themselves before they come. And fair enough, it's hard work being a bandsman. Anyway, the, the men were all gathered together there and we were chatting among ourselves as we waited for the band. And they, the conversation turned to what sort of tune would the band play? And somebody said, oh, it'll be, they'll play the Cock of the North. Do you know the Cock of the North? ta rum pa ra la 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 Well, we talked about that and I said, do you know the alternative words to that? Nobody did, so I told them the words, which were, Auntie Mary had a canary up the leg of her drawers. She pulled the string to mack it sing, and doon came Santa Claus. So uh, that requested a degree of amusement. Eventually the band turned up, 
They formed into position. Clooney gave the order to quick march, and off we went. And believe it or not, the very first tune played was the Cock of the North. And to my great delight, the Melkfersen males marched down the rain road singing about Auntie Mary, who was a bird fancier, but had grave problems with her underwear. So that's in a, quite, a, quite a different sort of thing. Um, what else? Oh, other, other gathering memories. What about the after Cayley Cayley and the Duke of Gordon? All crammed into the public bar downstairs there, shoulder to shoulder. All sorts of interesting songs being sung. Um, Bruce and Sunshine Mountain with everybody ending up standing on the tables. Or better still, what about Clooney and the Parachute Song? That wonderful one. Uh, he won't be with us this year, unfortunately, to sing that, but I, I, I do think that Jamie has got one with the continuation of the words, which is always very interesting. That's a, that's a good thing. Clooney also had a wonderful song. He didn't sing it every year, but I remember it. It culminated with him balancing a pint of beer on his head while he sang. Now, how many clan chiefs can you name doing that sort of thing? Um, what else? The clan walks. Now a great tradition. I think I couldn't be responsible for doing that sort of thing. I, um, I made a suggestion one year to council in the late 1980s. It was rather unfortunate that many people arrived in Newton Moor from literally from the other side of the world and all they saw of clan territory was the inside of the Duke of Gordon Hotel and the games field in Newton Moor. And I said, why don't they get out and about a wee bit more? Uh, what about a walk in some clan territory? Well, of course, when you suggest a thing like that, everybody says, oh, yes, that's a good idea. You go, you organize it, Sandy. So I had to. Now, the first walk that we did, which I think was about 1989, was probably the toughest one we've ever done. We climbed over the Corriereg. Now, that's a very steep pass. It's um, about 17 miles long. It climbs 2,000 feet and it's got about 13 hairpin bends. It's really quite hard going. We also had to organize transport to get us to the start and better still bring us back from the finish. Well, we assembled eight stalwarts, uh, a multinational expedition. I think we had Americans, we had Scots, we had English, we had New Zealander, um, quite interesting, and two dogs. And we did it. We, we got up there. We went over the top in, in different weather. We had a piper with us, an American whose name I've forgotten. I, th I think he's dead now. But um, he was not the best piper in the world, but he was an enthusiast. He played us off. He played us at the top of the pass. And when we were within a few hundred yards of the finish, he formed us up into three ranks and we marched in while he played Pack Up Your Troubles in Your Old Kit Bag. A wonderful memory. There we were met by a person, complete with a bottle of Cooney whiskey and freshly baked scones. Marvellous. Very good conclusion to any walk. And believe me, I think we are jolly glad of those refreshments. Um, what other things? What other things? Um, oh yes, uh, one other clan walk we had, which was involved more than walking. This is what I would call the Black Officer Trail. There we gathered at the clan museum. We took cars to Balachron, which is halfway between Kenyusi and Newton Moor, where the black officer lived. And we saw the ruins of his house. We then drove on, right on, a very long way, right up into Lonely Gaiac, right into the Cairn Gorms. We had to get special permission to get gates open for us and everything else like that. It was quite complicated. And we got there and then we walked several miles till we got to the place where the black officer met his, well, you can say, well-deserved end. It was interesting. We sheltered beside the memorial stone, and as we sheltered there from the storm, and it really was quite a nasty day of wind and rain, uh, I was reading aloud to the assembled multitude uh, a book, um, I think it's a, it was Affleck Gray's book of Legends of the Cairngorms, all about the final disaster which befell the black officer. Now, when we got back, I discovered this has been recorded by one of our number, uh, an American lady called Ruth McPherson, who I think came from Colorado, and she had a tape recorder. She was recorded me. And when the playback was there, it was quite incredible. I just reached the climax of the story when the storm broke and the avalanche came and a huge gust of wind came down to that moment. It whistled around the microphone. I tell you, the sound effects were fantastic. It really was remarkable. So we went back 
eventually to Kenyusi, and we ended up with what assembled round the black officer's grave. That was a, a very satisfying walk altogether. Um, what other things have we got about? I'm, um, our family, she's reasonably well represented today. I think our family have always been well represented. Catherine here on my right is the first lady chairman of the association, breaking new ground. We've had several lady chairmen since that time, a well-deserved honour, which she carried off with grace and elegance. Um, Bruce was our secretary for quite a number of years, and may be aspired to greater things. Um, Helen, who I see watching there on the screen, and Alison have both done great things. So I think our family have, I think we can say we've done our bit. Um, what else? What else? What else? Oh yes, one final thing, and this is quite a uh, this is almost emotional. Uh, the, I'm going back again to the clan march. We assembled old Ralea, we marched down the road, and we we're sheltered by trees for the first stage. Then we come out into the open. We're crossing the big concrete bridge over the River Spey. At that point, if there's a strong cross wind, the standard bearer should release his standard, and it blows out. And then, and only then, I, for me at least, you realise who you're with and what we're doing. You belong to the greatest clan in the world, and we're certainly going places. Now that's a good memory to go with, so watch out if you're going on the march. Um, I think that's about it as far as I'm concerned. I've rambled on about the first gathering and the 50th gathering. Um, we're just entering into the 75th, which will be exiting one too, but the really big one will come in 25 years' time, the centenary gathering. Now that will be a humdinger of a party, I can tell you. It's going to be great. Get your reservations in early. I look forward to seeing you all there. Right, both over to you now. <laughs> Those are one, wonderful anecdotes, and I want to know whether or not we still have a copy of that recording from Gaiac. Do we? Okay, excellent. Mari and Jim are nodding their heads, which is wonderful. <laughs> I need, to, I need I to hear that myself. It's one of the creepiest places I've ever been to. Is is Gaiac? It's just it's a weird. I was trying to my my partner Devante is is on the call today too, and I was trying to describe to him the feeling of being in Gaiac near the Black Officers' uh, final. Um, uh, resting place, as it were, <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it's a very spooky feeling, very spooky feeling. Well, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Ruth McPherson for some years. Uh, I, I hope she's still around, and I hope she's still got that tape recording. It might be worthwhile asking her about it. Bringing it back out again, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, I mean, we have about an hour and, and a half or so um, to use uh, as, as we see fit. Um, I'd like to ask the audience if you have any questions for Sandy, um, please feel free to either raise your hand virtually or in person. Yes, we have Galveston Island Democrats. <laughs> you have to introduce yourself. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm actually Kenneth uh, McPherson and I wanted to share, I, let me see. This is my passport, my US passport. And uh, I couldn't remember when I came to the games, uh, I've been there one time and I, I pulled out the passport and this is when they used to stamp passports. I don't think they stamp them anymore, but uh, it documented here that uh, on 30th of July, 1985, I came in to Gatwick and that was my trip to Newton Moore for the 1985 games. So now 37 years later, I'm coming back and uh, I'm bringing my partner, Peter, and uh, we look forward to a really good time this week. Right, well, I'm de delighted to hear from you. Um, pardon my dreadful geographical in uh, ignorance. Where is Galveston Island, please? Yes, Galveston Island is an island off of Houston, Texas. Oh. So we are connected to the mainland of Texas by a causeway, and we're about an hour southeast of Houston. Right. So you're deep in the heart of Texas, are you? Yes. You, yes. you are deep in the heart of Texas, are you? 
you cut out there. Sorry. Okay. Are you deep in the heart of Texas? No. Well, I actually was born in Kansas and I've lived in Texas since 1981. I, I grew up in uh, Wichita, Kansas, very close to where McPherson, Kansas is. You'll remember uh, General James Birdseye McPherson. Mm -hmm. There's a town there in Kansas named after that general mm -hmm. and uh, not too far from there. But uh, I've loved uh, Texas since 1981. Uh, Kansas was too cold for me. <laughs> well, we, we have been in McPherson, Kansas. The American branch of CMA had their gathering there one year. We took the long journey there, which was very interesting. And we got a wonderful welcome there. I remember that. They put up street banners to, to in all the lamp standards in the main street of McPherson, Kansas, to greet us. A wonderful thing. I think I even brought one back, which is somewhere in the museum, probably in the archives. <laughs> awesome. So do, do you have any memories? Were you at the gathering, Kenneth, uh, back in 85, or did you just attend the games and, and visit the museum? No, I was at the gathering. I, ca I came, I did everything. I remember going to the ball. As an American, I, I remember some things that were kind of quite small. Uh, I, I wasn't accustomed to uh, being so well treated and cared for at the ball. And uh, there, there was, I was definitely kind of felt out of place a little bit in that I didn't know exactly how I should be eating. <laughs> but because everything had a pattern to it and which was very good. And I, I, I just followed along and everything, but uh, it seemed like everybody used the kind of the same step and everything. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a grand time. I really loved my time there. And uh, I hope to be able to come back with more frequency now that I'm retired and have a little bit more means. All right, we shall look forward to seeing you. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. It's great to hear from people who haven't been uh, to, to a gathering in, in some time. And uh, Sandy certainly would have, would have been there at the same gathering. So um, we'll, have to, we'll have to look in the visitors' logs or something, Mari and Jim, to, to see if we can pull out a visitor log from, from the museum of that year. Um, that would be a fun thing to, to look back upon. Uh, any other questions for Sandy? I have some of my own, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it open to everyone else. Uh, I'm gonna make. I'm gonna embarrass you terribly, Sandy. So uh, just, yeah. just get ready for that. <laughs> I fear the worst. <laughs> and many, many on the call are, are family. For those who don't know, so uh, they they know all of all of the deep, dark, dirty secrets of of gatherings past. Uh, their father having been there for for all of them. Um, so what, uh, out of all these years, Sandy? A, a question: Which was your favorite gathering? You've you've gone through. You've mentioned some that have been. Great, oh. great memories for you, but was there one in particular that you will look back on and say that yeah. one, that was my day? I think, Bo, uh, people say that the gathering becomes very repetitious. We all do the same thing at the same time every year and so forth. I, I, I don't agree. I think every gathering has different, it, it has its own character and it's due to the people who are there, the people who come, who make it. I have no particular favorite one. I just look forward to every one when it comes. I'm delighted to meet a, meeting old friends and new. I think that's the best thing I can say. Well, in, 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 uh, as a follow-up to that, and I know I see that Mari and Jim have their hand up too, but just to, to piggyback off of that, um, we have a, a very uh, wide and, and active uh, diaspora. Um, and, and I'm curious to know, when did you see, having attended the first gathering back, back when, when did you start to see that the American, or I should say the North American, Australian um, branches and, and members of the, the association start to come back to the gathering in greater numbers? Has that been a progressive every year? Was there one year where it sort of started? Um, were there any Americans at the first gathering? I'm just, just out of curiosity. I don't recall any overseas people coming to that first gathering. I mean, after all, it, 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 traveling was difficult and expensive in those days. It, it was not an easy proposition traveling across the world to go to Scotland. I think that the overseas people started coming later, probably. 
uh, there was the if I recall the there was a I think there was a North American branch at that time of the association which later split into United States and Canada mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't recall any anybody from overseas coming I think that must have been a later phenomenon but of course now they come in in huge numbers we're delighted to see them right right um, no, excellent. I know I, I'm trying to remember when Clooney Castle was sold. I think some of the fundraising occurred um, in the North American branch was was tapped for that. Um, but I may be misremembering. Mari and Jim, I think you had your hand up. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm wanting to ask a question that I, I ask all McPhersons that I meet. And I, I'd like to ask you, Sandy and, and Catherine. Um, and everyone around the table, really. And it's, what does it mean to you to be a McPherson? It's oh. uh, always my favorite one. It's the, the identity <laughs> thing. Why, wh wh why do you keep doing it? I think it's, it's a family feeling. I feel that we are obviously all related, even at some very distant degree. But uh, I think it's just you're accepted into a big family. That's the most important part, I think. I don't know what other people feel about this. I think that Sandy's um, grandparents, Sir Stuart and Lady McPherson, were pillars of the village. And they encouraged um, that sort of going on, the gathering. And um, people followed because they respected these people. And you've, you've decided to raise your family um, in, in that way, which, um, you know, not, not everyone would. Um, and so I know Helen uh, and, and Douglas, you've got your hands up as well. Did you have a, a comment or question? Well, I, th I think Helen was introduced at a very early age to gathering. I remember on, she was a, a small baby in a carry cot. And one of the gathering attractions was a was a bus tour I think we went to Lagan or something I can't remember exactly but anyway sitting nearly opposite us uh, in the bus was the man who eventually became Clooney and his father now I think his I'm not sure if we, even if his father was chief at that time I think he was he was the sort of chief chief in waiting and at one point Helen, who always was a difficult child, of course, as we all know, <laughs> she, she, managed to wave her, she managed to wave her hand about and she lost a bangle. And the Clooney, the Clooney-to-be, picked it up and gave it back to her. Now, wasn't that a nice gesture? Introduction to Clooney. I can see Helen laughing here. <laughs> I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> you remember but, it well, but I, do, but I do remember going to Newton Castle and um, meeting old Clooney, Alan, and he was sitting in the entrance hall and he had his teeth in a glass. And I remember thinking, wow, what an amazing thing to be able to do. Take your <laughs> teeth out and put them in a glass. <laughs> oh, yes. I think I think that episode is now enshrined in Ewan's book, isn't it? <laughs> so I don't know. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a more classic I, one there. It was I who put the hand up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I put my hand up to to um, say one thing and ask one thing of Sandy. Uh, to say one thing is that uh, my most memorable rally was 1980, where I met uh, this. <laughs> absolute stunner in a ball gown um, <laughs> and that's stuck with me ever since but I'm sorry the question was what what were the roads like then Sandy because I remember my granny saying that she used to travel up and down from Edinburgh to Newton Moore and King Ussie, or King Ussie probably before the road was tarmacked. Oh, uh, I think that's going back a wee bit further than I would I must say. <laughs> I don't think it was quite as primitive as that, was it, when we drove? No, it was probably quite rough. It probably, yes, it, it, it certainly wasn't motorway standard, I'll put it that way. But nevertheless, it didn't stop Helen's husband's um, mother travelling up from Edinburgh to Kinusi for the school um, gathering. And every year she would drive all the way north on a very rough road, really, to go to the school reunion with all her friends and back she would go again 
And she did that for many, many a year, didn't she, Douglas? I, I do remember being driven up there once with my very aging deaf granny in a, a mini 600, which was about three inches from the floor. And I'm sure she was only doing 60, but it felt like about 140. <laughs> and I had to remind her, would you please look out the front window? That's the most important thing and stop talking to me. <laughs> but I remember later, and perhaps I shouldn't say this, but I remember my father and mother driving the three of us children up there, still on the old road, but Granny Isabel was in the back seat in the middle and she kept up something like four and a half hours of very loud talking. And my, my father, who was a, a very mild mannered man, was about five miles short of Newton Moor where he did almost an emergency stop in the old nine, at A9 and turned around and said, Mother, if you don't shut up, I'm going to throw you out of the car. <laughs> and that actually kept her quiet for about two and a half minutes. <laughs> Oh, well, happy memories, happy memories. <laughs> Let's see, uh, Kenneth, uh, I think you have your hand up again. Did you have something to, to contribute? Oh. Are we frozen? Kenneth, can you hear me? Oops, did we lose him? I think we lost him. All right, we'll, we'll eagerly await. Oh, there he is. I hear you, I hear you. Uh, sure. So I, I wanted to ask Sandy, uh, if if he uh, remembers anything about the Canadian Alan G. McPherson, and if he came to the games, and it, and and if he just remembers anything about Alan G. who wrote the posterity of the three brethren. Yes, I remember. I remember Alan G. very vividly. He was brought up in Edinburgh, educated at Edinburgh University, and then emigrated to Canada and became a professor, I think, was he not eventually? Am I right? I think he was a professor of geography, but his great love was genealogy. And he, he was a, an indefatigable ancestor chaser, I would put it that way. A very interesting man. Uh, he died a few years ago. His, Joyce, his wife, in fact, died very recently. Yes, so. yeah. she, she suffered from dementia, unfortunately, for many years. And their son, um, I'm sorry, I forgot. Ewan, his, Ewan? Ewan, is it? He is a very accomplished piper. Very accomplished. But uh, Alan G was a, a great pillar of the clan. He wrote some very, very good articles in Craig Do and is a, a very knowledgeable person indeed. His passing was a great loss. Great loss indeed. Joyce passed away three weeks ago. Oh, yes. very recently. Mm -hmm. I, I remember uh, I mentioned the, the boat trip to Clooney's Cage on Loch Erecht. Um, Alan and his son came out and they walked back, which was quite an achievement, very rough road, quite a, quite a long, because they, they were convinced there was an alternative venue for Clooney's Cage and they were determined to find it. I don't think they ever did, but they had a long hard walk in front of them looking for it. The rest of us sailed back in comfort and I say, I would like to say um, the McPherson gatherings are great, but I would like to think about all the McPhersons who have visited and or stayed with us. We have had so many friends over the years and it has just been wonderful to know them and to get better acquainted, introduce them to our children and then our children <coughs> in their late teens, going out to stay both in Canada and America with these wonderful new friends that we had made. I'm sure Hannah and you would agree with that. And Catherine, you're a rare cook, so I think that's why one of the reasons why we all keep coming back to, to see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's your Ekaflecken tart. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sandy, I, I have to mention um, the monarch of the Glen era because I think that's probably one of the things, at least in North America, we, we look back to as a, um, a particularly bright light um, for the Badenox or Spey area and, and we feel a certain kinship towards that, that television show. Did things change at all around that time when, when the, uh, the program was aired? 
um, in relation to the gathering? Did you see an uptick in, in visitors? Was there more enthusiasm? Did it lead to sort of a revival of things McPherson and, and uh, mm -hmm. clan systems, uh, et cetera? Well, I think the Monarchs of Glen series, which I think lasted for about seven years on BBC television, uh, it, it put Badenoch on the map. I mean, the, many of the hotels still advertise the Monarch of the Glen territory. Uh, it was all filmed in a place called Ardverity, which is a rather splendid place on Loch Lagan. Um, uh, I think, Bo, when you, when you came across as an intern, did we not go and speak to the factor at Ardverity? Yes, I have, I have a wonderful picture of you and I, I uh, standing in front of the, of the structure. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was, and, uh, was a great picture that we had. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember asking him, I said, uh, I hope the BBC looked after you well for using your estate for location shots. And he said, we got a new roof out of it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think it must have been a major sum. But it, it did put that part of the world on the map. Um, quite a lot of the actors were there for most of the summer. They took part in local activities. Um, I can't remember the name. Who was the lady's name? Was it Susan Hampshire? Was she in it? Can you remember? Do remember? She lived in Newton Moore. She she took part in all sorts of local activities. She went to the local Cape Fit class and things like that. She was fun, and uh, one of one of the actors actually took part in the Clan March. I recall that. Um, but it's it's an interesting series. It. Um, it may be revived, I don't know, I've never heard of it being revived, but it, it, was, it was very interesting and I think it did have a good effect. Um, it was enjoyable, it, anyway. As I went, Kenneth, you've seen, you've seen Monarch of the Glen, I'm, I'm assuming, yes? No? Oh, you have to watch it. You'll notice a lot of the, the scenes that you'll, you'll remember from, from Gatherings Past. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a fun series to watch. Um, the acting is is um, is what it is, but the <laughs> the scenery is wonderful. <laughs> the scenery is is fantastic. So um, I think I, I still have mine somewhere on VHS. Um, <laughs> not that I have a means of playing it any longer. The, um, the estate has been used quite a lot of times for filming since that time. It's really on the map. In fact, the latest James Bond film, some of the chase sequences were done in the estate roads there. Oh really? Oh, that makes sense. Okay. I'll have to watch it again with that in mind. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of the, one of the wrap-up questions here that I that I have for you, um, Sandy. What what do you think um, your legacy will be? Um, certainly your family is, is a remarkable and wonderful legacy to to carry on the, the tradition, but what do you think your individual legacy? will be um, related to the association and, and to, to gatherings in the future. When, when people look back um, at, at gatherings in the 2000s, what will they remember most about you? I have something that I will remember most, but, and, I, and I hope that others will share their memories too. But what, what do you look back on and say, you know, that, that's what I contributed, that's what I've done? Oh, I, I think, as you say, the best contribution is our, is our family, who are destined for great things, aren't they? Don't you, wouldn't you agree? Mm. No, I think so. Oh, no, I think uh, anything, uh, I will sink into obscurity, but they will go from glory to glory. I think as a raconteur, you'll be remembered. Absolutely, as an historian, certainly. Yes. But, but I also think that um, your appearance as the midge has to go down <laughs> in the history book, too, <laughs> in terms of legacy. Uh, <laughs> That, that's the one that comes to mind for me, and I hope that we'll be able to, to see it. Can you talk a little bit about the, the conception of the midge? Because that midge. was remarkable. Well, blame my two daft daughters for that. <laughs> <laughs> it was all their fault. <laughs> Again, I was cajoled into it. Say I may mean. say, though, that um, if you are coming to this year's gathering, we're not having a repeat of the midge, but there might be something else. I'm not giving you any secrets away at this point, but watch the Kaylee. All right. I yes. love it. Yes. Another, another yes. wee yes. yes. It won't last long, but it'll be there. Don't worry. Well, that's wonderful. Any questions from the audience as we've been uh, reminiscing on, on games and gatherings past? We have this um, recording right now, and we hope that we'll be able to uh, keep this as part of our digital archive and so generations from now we'll be able to look back uh, and 
uh, remember your remembrances um, and perhaps include them into part of the uh, the museum exhibitions. So this has been really exciting. So once you're in the museum, Sandy, right, you're, you're, you become an exhibit yourself. <laughs> right, where am I stuffed and put in a glass case? <laughs> <laughs> next, to, next to Jeremy, we'll even get your picture in the Sunday Times. <laughs> well, this has been wonderful, everyone. Um, Sandy, I, I think uh, that you, you certainly um, have the reputation, as Catherine said, of a great raconteur. Um, you, you have the history of the clan and the appreciation of, of everyone who has met you over the years. I know that I say that for myself and for, for others on the call today, too. Um, so, and I, I am looking very much forward to, to seeing you in a couple of weeks' time, or a week's time, actually, just a week's time, and uh, making some new memories, which we'll be able to talk about at, at a, uh, a program like this in the future, I hope. Good. Well, thank you very much, Bo. But I think that we must all be a debt of gratitude to Bo and Ayla between them, who I think have set all this evening up. It's to be the first of a series, and I'm certainly looking forward to any subsequent events like this. It should be very good fun. Looking forward yes, to that. Yes, absolutely. So stay tuned. The calendar is posted on social media. Um, we also at the gathering, too, I'll, I'll put in a, a brief um, plug for uh, our, uh, this is Scotland's Year of Stories. And we will be going around with uh, recording devices um, to record some of your memories uh, from past gatherings, um, reflections on, on Badenoch and Stress Bay area um, as part of our, our commitment to preserving a digital record of, of uh, the McPhersons and, and of this particular region. So um, when you see us, uh, please uh, give your story and, and encourage others to do the same. But thank you all. Have a wonderful evening, those of you in the UK, and, and a wonderful afternoon, those of you in North America. And we will see you soon. Thank right. you very much. Bye now. Bye bye.